Yes. Yeah, it'll be easier. No, it's you're on your, yeah, it'll be on your uh, on that. laptop. Now let's have it here. Okay. Yeah. That's even better. Okay. Are we recording? All right. Yes. Today we have Kira Derichiela from Hofstra University, who will talk about representation of convex geometries of convex dimension three by spheres. Thank you very much um, for introduction. So what I want to do today is to discuss with you convex geometries that could be represented by convex shapes, such as spheres or ellipsoids. And in addition, they will have convex hull operator as a part of definition. And that's a special convex hull that adjusted to the shapes that we work with. And then we specifically will focus on geometries of convex dimension three. So I will introduce this parameter for convex geometries and explain why this might be interesting. Turns out this problem that we worked on connects to all the problem from 80s and 90s um, about description of sphere order. And so my goal is to present you the results of the paper that we wrote um, with Arafa Garval and uh, Maniba. Um, and it has a title, the same title as this talk. So let me start with a main definition. Um, so convex geometry is just a, a set system. You have a base set, which will carry as an X throughout the talk. Uh, you could do it for um, arbitrary set X, but in the talk, we will be concerned only with finite set X. And then you have a family of subsets, G, um, and it has several properties. So the first property is just simple, that you include empty set. The second is one um, very important, that if you have two sets, in the family, then intersection must be in the family. And the third property is specific just for convex geometries. I will mention to this a bit after the definition. If you have any set in your family and it's not the whole set X, then you could have another set, you should have another set that extends this set by a single point. So if you have Z, then you have Z with another point X also included in that G. So first of all, notice that from property three and one, you would have empty set and that should be extended by single point. So you would need to have in G1, a uh, one element set. And then you apply property three again, and it should be extended by another point. So you would have a two element set there and you continue applying the property three until you actually reach X, right? Because it's a finite set. So X will be included as well as a part of that combination of these properties. So now if you have property two and the property that the whole set is included in the family, this is more general definition of a closure system. So it's a set system with just these two properties. Now it turns out that um, these are very ubiquitous concept in mathematics. So you have closure systems everywhere, like if you're aware of it or not. Um, and this family by containment forms a partial ordered set. It's a natural partial ordered set where you could say it one set is smaller than the other because it's included in another. And so we will be dealing with this type of post sets um, naturally established on this family G. Now it turns out that because it's a closure system in general closure systems always post sets, right? So the set system is a post set but it has additional properties that every two elements have a least upper bound and greatest lower bound. So in particular, they are lattices. I don't really need too much from like, just real lattice theory in this talk, so I will not be focused too much on that, but you could always think, okay, so this family G, as long as it's a closure system, uh, must be a lattice. And um, I will be using one toy example of uh, convex geometry in this talk. So we'll try to explain the concept. So let's start with that example. It has base set of four elements, A, B, C, D. And the family G1 um, includes those subsets. All right, to simplify notation, I'm not using curvy brackets to identify set, right? So I'm not putting curvy brackets around and I don't put, and I don't put comma between elements. 
So like ACD, for example, means that it's a subset that contains A, C, and D from X. So now let's start to, well, because it's a pulse set, we could use a visualization tool known, known as a Hasse diagram. Let's see the Hasse diagram because it's easier to see the structure of, of this family. Um, and it looks like a graph, but it's not. So there's a different meaning. Um, all subsets in the family represented by vertices like in the graph. And at the same time, the location in the, in the picture important. So the higher you go in the picture, the bigger sets you have. Um, so the bottom element is empty set, but because in the lattices, notation typically for the lowest element is a zero. So I keep kind of zero representing empty set. And all others, uh, all other subsets in the family marked by um, elements, right, that included in that set. And the top element is the whole set X. Now, when we put the edge between two vertices, we put the edge uh, where a lower set is smaller and contained in the larger set, but there is no other elements in between. So, for example, CD, which is in the middle, I don't know if I would be able, okay, so you could, you could see my hand, right, around CD, and it's a smaller than BCD, but also smaller than ABCD, so it's contained as containment order. Um, and of course, CD is smaller than ABCD, but we don't put the edge right, between CD and ABCD because there is an element BCD in between. So, but you could always travel from smaller set to bigger set along those edges if you go in the same direction up. All right, so you notice that some of the vertices are colored by red and some are blue. Uh, the explanation will come later, but pay attention that we do have uh, specific elements in, uh, in the Hasse diagram of, of this particular convex geometry. All right, so uh, to tell you why convex geometry is important, we need to start maybe with one model of convex geometry became very important um, in the work with, with the structures. So to say kind of introduction to this, it mimics convex sets, but makes it in kind of the strict, uh, um, discrete uh, manner. Um, so let me describe what, um, how the convexity could be actually described by convex geometries. By set X, we take set of points in um, n-dimensional space. And so it could be finite set, like for our purposes, it's a finite. And then a subset of X would be called convex if it's intersection of some convex set in that space with X. Uh, well, because there might be students uh, attending this talk, I would say convex set means that if you, if you have two points in a set, then the, um, um, the segment connecting them also should be included. So as long as you follow this property, right, that the will you could describe convex sets, you could understand them. All right, so uh, one major, you know, observation is that if you start with any finite set of points in any space around and take a family of these convex subsets, all subsets that could be obtained as intersection of some convex set with set X, then you will get a convex geometry. Surprisingly, you will have this property of extending by one element among all the sets that you have. All right, so let's see this example. Uh, this is a new example. The set X has five points on the plane. Now this, um, the triangle and shading is not a part of a structure. It's just for visualization. So what we see that the family of relatively convex sets, as we say, relative to X, um, practically all sets except three that excluded. So let's take uh, one of them because it's easier to describe convex sets here than non-convex. So let's say, for example, that A not A1 and A2, this is a vertices of a triangle, will not be included. It's not convex set because every convex set on a plane that contains this vertices of this triangle will include also point inside. Now, because this set is missing that point, uh, will be will not be convex. 
And so two others that exclude it also have the same failure. So they include the vertices of some triangle, but exclude the point inside of it. But all other subsets of, of this five element set, so to two minus three, right? So you would have 29 of them included, right? In this convex geometry. All right, so this type of uh, convex geometry that you could obtain from this, I would say, con a point configuration in some space is called a fine convex geometry. Have a special term attached to it, and um, this is an important survey of 1985 by Edelman and Jamison called this area of convex geometries. It discusses, in particular, a fine convex geometries. Of course, the 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 first important example that in, in initiated the study, but also there are other examples: down sets and post sets. Convex subsets of a post set, connected subgraphs sharing a root and connected graphs, subsemilatices of a semilatice. So it's actually a lot of examples and more in this survey. And then more recent survey, um, we wrote together with my collaborator, JB Nation, and it was included as a chapter in a book series on lattice theory and applications that was published in 2016. So if you're interested in more recent development of that, in particular in infinite convex geometries, then it's included in that survey. So now we pay attention a little bit to another aspect of convex geometries. The, the matter is that they could be defined differently uh, rather than family system, right? With this family that we described with three properties. We could associate it with this um, closure system, right? As we call um, a special operator that acts on subsets of, of a base set X. Okay, keep in mind, suppose we do have this family system. There is this associated closure operator. It takes any input. Let's uh, call this uh, subset A in X and see what the output will be. As an output, we define a smallest subset in that given family that contains that A. Now, why this smallest set exists because the closure system is closure under intersection and has the whole set X. So you would find at least X contains any set. And then if there's a more, you just take intersection, right? So this phi of A will be just that smallest set in that family that contains A. From this, it follows easily that this phi operator that acting on subsets now has these three properties. It's increasing, monotone, and idempotent. So why it's idempotent? Phi of A is now element of your closure system, right? So now if you want to apply this again on that um, subset, you want to get a minimal subset in the family containing it. It's itself. So applying it second time doesn't change it. So we see this closure operator. Again, this is the biggest concept in mathematics. It appears everywhere, um, if we know or not. So in particular, it's behind uh, Kind of, you know, closure system and in particular convex geometries. But remember the convex geometries, it's not just arbitrary closure system. It has this property of extension by one element and corresponding property of closure operator is called the anti-exchange property. Now, because we will not be using it in the talk today, I will not go into the details. I just want you to, to be aware that this operator exists. And say in Matro is another um, example of uh, set systems, the corresponding operator will be uh, the exchange operator. So that kind of says the uh, almost opposite thing. Um, anyway, this is why matroids and uh, convex geometry is somehow two opposite sides of the world because they satisfy almost opposite properties of closure operator. All right, anyway, so we want to understand what this. Uh, Operator associated with relatively convex sets, right? So, because we going back um, to say a fine convex geometries, because they tell you that convex geometry is coming, you know, by representation of point configurations. So, uh, here the operator will be connected to the convex hull operator. So, what convex hull operator? You take any set of points, say on a plane. And then you generate the smallest convex set that contains those points. It's called the convex hull of that 
set. So as an example, illustrating here, say we have uh, seven points on the plane, and then say if the five of them, A, C, D, F, G, um, the actual vertices of this convex five gone, and it includes points B and E. So when you apply convex hull to these five points, you get all seven points. So as you see, this convex hull operator will get you exactly those relatively convex sets, right? When you apply it. And so uh, this is a direct uh, description of this convex hull operator that acts now on a finite set of points in um, a space Rn. You just apply convex hull to any subset, then intersect with x, because at the end you need just to, to get a subset of x. And of course you will get the same convex geometry, a fine one, right? And if I, uh, through the talk, use terminology like convex set or closed set, this is all attributed to um, the range of this operator. The phi of A is always relatively convex set, right? That's now sitting. All right, so this is, we, we just considered these two sides of a uh, closed system called as a, convex geometry, so let's try to proceed uh, getting closer to what we need, and we need uh, the definition of convex dimension. Um, and so for that, I need to introduce the um, this operation that we could do for two convex geometries defined on the same set. Now, it turns out there is a lot of convex geometries you could define on the same set. Like later, I will mention a project I did with students where on the five element set, there is a 672 different non-isomorphic convex geometries. And when you go into the six element set, this uh, becomes about 350,000 of them. So it grows like dramatically fast. So if you have two of, um, we call them say F and G, right? So think of them again. Those non-isomorphic? Non-isomorphic. So that means that if, if you just change the notation, you will not count them. Yeah. Um, so let's see if we have two families, F and G, right? Both of them convex geometries, right? We want to define a new geometry, which will include both of this. So the definition will be, I uh, will call it a join. It looks like a symbol of V, right? And between F and G, it's actually just a symbol of a join in lattice theory. So, we will include all the sets that could be obtained as intersection of F, a set from F and set of G from G. Notice that because you know capital G has the whole set X, and in particular X intersecting with any set from F will get that set from F. So in particular, the whole family F included, whole family G included, and also closed under intersection. But we will see, oh, is it still satisfying the third property of geometry's extension by one element? It turns out this simple definition will bring us a convex geometry again. So if original closure systems were uh, convex geometry, so we, we, they had the one uh, point extension property that the join will also have it. So we'll get a new convex geometry. And then the second um, concept that we need to understand before introducing convex dimension is a, a linear subgeometry. So what I mean by that is, remember I, I mentioned to you because of that third property, one point extension property, um, if I start with empty set, which is in my family, right? I should have one element set necessarily appearing and then two elements set extending and then the third element set extending it until I get to the X. So if I just include those sets as a pass from empty set to X, I will get F1, a subfamily, which actually forms a geometry itself. So it's by itself, it's a convex geometry on the same set. And my original family F might have multiple linear subgeometries like that. So now if, uh, if you understand that, I will explain it on example on the next slide. So if you have questions, maybe I will answer after I show the slide. So now convex dimension is simply the minimal number of those linear subgeometries such that every set in the whole family is intersection. So it's a join of, of those linear geometries. All right, let me just illustrate. I think it will be much clearer on the picture. By the way, this picture was created by 
um, Araf and Nama during the, I will say it a bit later, right? When we were working together. So it's actually, I borrowed their slide <laughs> from some earlier presentation. All right, so here we see a new example of a convex geometry, like as a Hasse diagram. And you see sub-geometry on the, as a red one on the left, right? As you see, you, you travel from empty set, then A, then AB, then ABC, then the whole set. And then another one, which is um, um, yellow. So you start with a D, because it's you have another one on the set in the, in the family, and you proceed with a CD and BCD, and then the whole set X again. So we have two sub-geometries. They both linear, clearly. Um, but you notice that all other sets in this family is intersection of elements from there. So for example, B, the one element set is intersection of A, B, and B, C, D. So as I want a picture, you would see this B, for example, which doesn't get into any linear geometry of two, right? Is intersection of A, B, and B, C, D. So you could get it as intersection. And two others are the same, right? So B, C is also intersection and C is intersection. So that means that the convex dimension of this geometry is two, because we were able to represent it with two and definitely if we remove one of them, it's not representing the whole family mm -hmm. because it will be just one linear geometry left. I also want to point that this is another example of, um, I was showing earlier, um, so, I mean, I was introducing the definition of a fine, but I never showed you uh, a fine example. So this is a fine geometry. And um, you have four elements and they could be represented by points. And in fact, you just need a one dimensional space. You could just point, put those points on the line in the same order, A, B, C, D. And what you would see uh, will represent all the relatively convex sets, right? Of this point configuration. Now, because my one element subsets are actually also on one line, right? So you could imagine that they're just sitting on the line, the points, and every single point is a convex set itself, right? Because a singleton is a convex set, and all others represent just some two element or three element set, right? So for example, AC is not present, right? AC is not present because it's not convex, because B is in between. So this is, um, one aspect of a fine convex geometry is that singletons always present in, in your family. And unfortunately, not all convex geometries are fine because not always singletons are present. For example, the, this toy example that I started with, as you see singletons, there's only two of them, even though the base set has four elements. Um, and so there's only D present and B present, but then um, if you look at the smallest set that contains A, then we'll have D in it, right? And then the smallest set that contains C will be C in it. You notice that I do have red uh, vertices, and we'll see later, it looks like I point that this actual smallest set in the family containing A, B, C, and D. So there's a four of them, right? So they all marked red. And they are not singletons, not all of them are singletons. Well, so this means that this geometry in particular cannot be represented by points. It's not defined. And so the suggestion was, came up with a paper of Gabor Savlin in 2014. He said, why to use only points? Let's use circles. Let's allow circles. Or if we go in a high dimensional space, let's allow balls um, of that dimension. And so like we could include points as well because they're just uh, circles of radius zero. So let's allow them. But we need to modify the, uh, the operator right? so to define convex geometries. What, what now will be relatively convex sets, right? So what will be the convex operator of, of taking convex all, right? And including everything. Okay, so C5 circles. And so if, so for example, we wanna take a convex how now your axe elements, right? The elements of your axe are just circles. 
So what would the convex hull of B, C, and D? So B and C, there are these large ones, and their D is just a point. So if I take a convex hull, treating them as a set of points, I will get this uh, curvy shape. And on the left picture, it includes fully the circle A and another point E. While on the right side, E is still there, but A is only partly there. So the definition of convex hull for circles means that we only include the circle when it's completely inside in the convex hull of circles. But we take a convex hull of circles, just a regular convex hull of set of points, right? Treating them as a set of points. All right, so we kind of modify this convex operator acting on circles now. And it turns out it's still convex geometry. So it still will have this anti-exchange property. And with the circles, we still could generate convex geometry representing. And now if we go back to this example that I presented, can be represented by points, but now it could be represented by circles. So this is representation uh, by circles. So what was the problem before? Because A was not a singleton. So now if I take A in this big circle, right? And try to generate the convex hull, and we need to include all the circles, right? We'll get into the convex hull. We'll see that D will be inside. So the convex hull of A will include D. That's what exactly what we wanted. It's not a single, then it has two elements. And then C, convex hull of C will also include D. And also we see the convex hull of A and B. If you take a convex hull of A and B of these big circles, you would include everything, right? The C will get there and D will get there. And that's exactly what G1 describes. Now it's a convex sets of circles um, included in G1, exactly. So was that the motivation for yes. using circles to represent yes. more geometry? Exactly, yeah. It was representing more geometries. So now it's also motivating was that sadly proved that every geometry of convex dimension two is represented by circles on a plane. You don't even need to go like closer into, into space. And of course, the natural question, can we do it for all, right? For all geometries. And I learned about this paper in 2013. And in 2014, we already started working with my student, Medina Balad at the time, and where she was, she was a, a junior, a graduate student. And so we worked the whole year. And by the end of the year, a big surprise. Every configuration of five circles on the plane satisfies special property. We found this property, it's called weak carousel property. I don't want to go into the details, right? Because I need to get to the those are results. But as a result of that property, some geometries fail it. So there might be a convex geometry that fail in this property. There's a geometric property of circles on the plane, which we were not aware. So it's kind of new property. And we were able to find uh, an example of five element, um, um, the geometry on the five element set with a convex dimension six, they cannot be represented by circles on the plane. Well, so of course the, the next question, so it become more and more questions now, right? So can we represent that one say by balls in a high dimensional space? What if we change the circles into ellipses, right? Because we kind of, because the leap you like, on ellipses, this property fails. Um, and moreover, what happens for the dimensions three, four, and five? Because now you have a gap, right? So for two, you can, and for six, you cannot. So what's, what's going? Maybe we could find a smaller example, right? Of geometry with a smaller dimension. Intuitively, smaller dimension means that you have less number of sets, right? And may, less complexity of the geometry. And so at the 2020, I joined this project. Uh, that was a summer of pandemic, the terrible season where everyone's sitting at home and particular students couldn't <laughs> go to their REU projects or something, right? And so I joined a, a group of faculty uh, that was uh, from different universities who decided to, to run an online project, which we called Polymass REU 2020. So now it runs every year, actually, and there's more of them. But um, at that time, every faculty who volunteered got a group of students between 20 and 30 students. <laughs> and I said, okay, so what I could do with this group? <laughs> I said, okay, 
We know that there's a 672 different geometries on the five element set. The one that we know fails, we have convex dimension six. What if we just go and check by hand all of them? It doesn't seem to be too much when you have 20 students, right? Maybe we'll find more and smaller examples. And so as a result, we found that 49 we couldn't represent. And some of them had dimensions four and five. So we did find smaller examples. We also proved that for seven geometries, we really can't represent that. So we found a new geometric property for not representing. And unfortunately, everything with the dimension three what was still represented. So, and that's why that three became kind of interesting. Okay, what happens at three? Um, so by the time uh, of 22, I, I became a part of New York District Mathematics RU. And so I was mentoring two student, students during that summer. Um, they were in um, the, the project ran in Baruch College. Um, and we, we chose our students from 500 applicants. So it was a high competition to get <laughs> into those spots. And so I thought, okay, so because we generated interesting um, uh, interesting questions there, say convex dimension three, now can we describe geometries representable by circles? Maybe we could find a concrete example not re representable by ellipses because we couldn't find before. And of course the main question, right, is if everything representable in some space remains. And out of these four questions, I thought, okay, convex dimension three might be the simplest. <laughs> Let's try. And so, so that was the main question that I showed to students. And what is dimension three? So this was my team. Arafa Garval and Nama Neva joined me in this project uh, during summer. And we were kind of hopeful because of this paper of 2017 by Richter and Rogers, they were able to represent every convex geometry actually with M guns. So if it's a convex dimension N, they said, oh, we, we need a special construction of clustered N guns and we could represent every convex geometry. So for N equals three, that means the representation was, was with circle, or with the triangles. And so we started doing, okay, what did we take, start with this triangle representation and kind of try to morph them into circular representation, right? Doing different modifications, right, of that representation. So we tried and tried during summer and everything was failing. By the end of summer, we realized that we probably cannot solve this problem in generality, but at least maybe for six elements set where there's a, about 150,000 of geometries of dimension three, non-isomorphic, we cannot check it by hand, but maybe at least there we, we could have some pass for proving it. So we still have this hope that for six element set geometries, we could still prove, right? So we could represent by circles on the plane. But we finished the summer with not having a result generally, and we continued to work in the fall. And that's where we did main discovery. When I say discovery because we just found the paper uh, of that was written 25 years earlier by this uh, group of famous uh, combinatorialists, Halsner, Fishburne, and Trotter, in 99, published this paper that was a result of a big effort for maybe 15 more years of the, by different people to prove uh, one conjecture that was posed earlier. Okay, so if you read the abstract of this talk, that's where it explains a bit. So in 1984, um, Fishburne and Trotter, they attended this famous band conference on other sets. And uh, during the talk, they proposed the question. They asked, what, can we represent finite three-dimensional pole set as inclusion order of circles on a plane? Sounds a bit familiar, right? So for, for what we were talking about geometries, but it's kind of setting a bit different. And then in 89, Brightwell and Winkler put that as a part of the general, more general question is that every finite pole set as a sphere order in some space. All right, let me just uh, explain the like, well, main definitions here. So first of all, pole set is 
is just, again, um, a set with this binary relation that says one element smaller than the other in some way, right? Um, so representation by set of, of objects means that you're kind of mapping elements of P into object, meaning that whenever X smaller than Y in your partial that it's set, then for objects, the smaller object is included in the bigger object. So there's a just inclusion order between objects. So a pole set is a sphere order where this object has spheres in some space. So X smaller than Y simply means that sphere X is included in sphere Y in some R2D, right? In the some D-dimensional space. All right, so that's what the sphere order means. And then N-dimensional pole set. N-dimensional pole set means that you would take a pulse set and take a linear extension of it. What is a linear extension? Okay, add more relationship between elements so they become like numbers on the line. So it's a linear extension of your partial order. It's always possible to do by multiple extensions, right? There's a multiple extensions of into linear order of, of any pulse set. And so the minimal number of such extensions such that the intersection gives you original order is called dimension of that pulse set. So you see in convex geometries, we have convex dimension here, we have just dimension. Sounds familiar, like sounds similar, but we'll see later. Um, so what they were able to prove after, you know, hypothesis that was that it's not possible to represent all finite pulse sets as a sphere order. And they proved it in 99. So that's a negative result saying, okay, for some humongous number and not, starting from that humongous number and not, everything which is greater than that number, if you take pulse set n cube, n is just a linear order of elements from zero to n minus one, n element linear set, and then take a direct product, right? It's by itself three times. So you have triples of these elements zero to three n minus one with the order being component wise. So that's just n cube. And so it's definitely three dimensional poset. And so they prove that for some humongous and not will not be a sphere order. The proof is extremely technical. So if, if there's a student, you know, wanting to just see highlighted points, right, in the proof, here they are done by one of my students, right, who read the paper. And as you see, item two, apply product to Ramsey theorem. So Ra Ramsey um, theory is a part of combinatorics that deals with, uh, dealing with a structure of objects where you could split them into parts and try to prove that some property holds in one of the parts, so more or less. And typically the results will tell you though, that some cardinality, finite cardinality of, of, of these objects, this might happen, right? Starting from big cardinality, this property will occur in a particular part of, of your structure. So anyway, so I'm just giving you an idea that it's uh, what type of proof was that, but it's also was running on top of very technical construction. Anyway, so the very hard proof. And so now I wanna try to see that then we do have a transition from that result to what we wanted for convex geometries of dimension three. So this is based on a very simple lemma, uh, which we put in our paper uh, with, um, with Araf and uh, Nama. Um, so it was placed in archive in 23. So I, I'm putting this um, this this year, right? So it's a still like it's submitted to the journal. We're still waiting on reviews. All right. So here I need to to tell you that there is, if you consider the finite convex geometry, remember we have this is a pulse set of these subsets, right? If you look at the sum of them, very specific ones, they call joint reducible elements because it's formal lattice, or it's a joint reducible elements coming from lattice terminology. So if we're able to represent the geometry, convex geometry by spheres in any space, then this subset of joint reducible elements 
you know, lattice, right, representing our convex geometry, will represent the sphere order on the same spheres that we use for representation. So it's the sphere order is actually sitting inside of convex geometry who are able to represent it by spheres. All right, so I will do the illustration again, right? So now we're coming back to our, you know, to our example. Remember, we were able to represent it by spheres, right? So what are the joint reducible elements? The joint reducible elements, though, exactly red elements. All of them have just one edge going down. All other elements have two edges or more edges, right, in general. Mm -hmm. But those with having only one edge down, there's a called joint reducible elements. So they are simultaneously the minimal sets in your family that contain a singleton, right? So we already established the earlier. The minimal one containing A is AD. The minimal containing B is B itself. Minimal containing C is CD. And minimal containing D is D. So suppose we represent it by circles. That means that it's a convex hull of that element. So convex hull of AD, Let's see the representation. Convex hull of A includes D. This is why we see it there, AD. Convex hull of C includes D, right? This is why we see it there. So it's a convex hull of each circle that's actually represented by joint reducible elements. So say in this geometry, I skipped that slide because I think I need a little bit of acceleration, but it's actually talks about this, what we, what I'm just telling you, right? So, um, so these elements are just convex hull of each particular circle. So here we have four joint reducibles corresponding to each circle. And the partial order that we see there is a D included in AD and D included in CD and all other, you know, not related. And so we see that in fact, D is included in A. So we represent now I'll just draw the Hasse diagram of just of that portion, right? Of the joint reducible element, just four elements. The red ones you saw in the convex geometry, what you see on the right side, I see the spheres themselves, that each of them generating that convex set on the left, right? So A is a larger than D, so it's a sitting alone, and the C is greater than D is sitting alone. So on the right side, the same post set is a sphere order of the same spheres. So that's the main discovery basically to understand that whenever we represent convex geometry, joint reducibles are sphere orders of the same spheres. So that allows us to say, oh, maybe whatever they prove, right? So that's M cubed for some humongous great N. What if we would be able to represent, you know, convex geometry um, on spheres, right? With um, so that M cube will be whole set of joint reducibles that will connect, right, with, with their example. But one question about this convex dimension, is it the same as a dimension, right? That they, you know, they have three-dimensional pulse sets. That's kind of the last piece that we need to understand, right? It turns out that's completely different parameters because convex, Geometry is a pulse set itself, it's even more, it's a lattice. Um, and so it's convex dimension, you know, introduced differently. So this paper was uh, appeared very recently by Knauer and Trotter, right, 23 archive. They built a sequence of pulse sets, PN. So all of them are three dimensional as pulse sets. And all of them are convex geometries but their convex dimension grows to infinity. So in fact, you would have tendency to have a larger convex dimension than the actual dimension of a pulse set. So there are like really gap, huge gap between them. So that means that for us, like if we would try to construct convex geometry of dimension, convex dimension three, that will be tough, right? So it's, uh, because typically this convex dimension is greater than pulse set dimension. And that's what we tried for the whole semester. Very, very many like uh, um, in successful attempts until we finally, you know, hit it with the correct attempt. And so my feeling is that 
you first need to guess, right? To guess the correct construction and only go after that. And that will be proved easily. So in fact, the proof is very easy when you already know construction. But it took the whole semester to actually get to that. All right, anyway, so we have the same negative result connecting to um, result of 99, negative result of 99. Is it, does it use the result? Yes. Okay. So I will show you the, the sort, right? So suppose, suppose we have convex geometry representable by spheres in any space. We take that geometry, right? We take uh, joint reducible elements. Um, and if we're able to, to make, it in, make a construction that this joint reducibles form n cube for any n. And our geometry will be of convex dimension three. And we do it for every n. Of course, we could hit also this humongous n zero, right? That means that for starting with that humongous n zero, whatever we create will, will not be representable by spheres. Otherwise, this n cube will be representable as sphere over. Um, so for us, that was just this, this third item, construct the convex geometry of, of convex dimension three. Right, so that the joint reducibles form this pulse set and cube. Then we'll just get the, the conclusion. So the key of the result is actually in the construction. And I'm showing how to do construction when n is two. So n is just two, but it works for every n, okay? So n has a zero and one, so zero smaller than one. So we generate n cube. And cube is just triple, so it's zeros and one, so it's eight elements is that the order there is the point-wise, right? So this P order, we call it P, right, over here. So the triple smaller than this triple if component-wise is smaller, right, less than or equal. Well, so we have these eight elements. I want to impose a special order on them, so linear order. I want to order them. And my order is called one, two, three, lax. And so what I show it here, this is one, two, three, lax order on these triples. So what it means a one, two, three. So because the first digit is one, that means that I will be paying attention first on the first component of a triple. So as you see, the half of them with a zero on the first component come before the last four that have one in the first component. And then after we completed that ordering, within the zero in the first component, Next, we'll look at the second component. And again, the first would come those with a zero component and a second position, and only after those with a one in the second position. And finally, three, within each pair that you already have a first and second equal, you would put first zero and then one. So this is one, two, three, like so, that means that, okay, so it's almost like a knot in the dictionary, right? Where the first is important and second important and third is important. But we also create two, three, one lex and three, one, two lex. So it will be two more orderings, right? Depending on which component is more important, first and then second and then third. So you would have three linear orders of these eight elements. Now create the geometry by starting empty set, then adding 0, 0, 0, then adding 0, 0, 1, then adding 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1. So you would have a linear geometry on these eight elements. And then use 2, 3, 1 lex order to build this linear geometry starting with empty set, adding points, well, elements, the triples, as we go along to 3, 1 lex ordering. And then the third one, as we go through the 3, 1, 2 lex ordering. So because, and then generate by the three, Linear geometries generate the geometry, which is taking intersections, right? And so definitely you will have convex dimension three. Most important, the joint reducible elements isomorphic to n cube. That will be the joint reducibles will be isomorphic to this two cube in this geometry. Yeah. So it proves that, that you could you could do convex geometry of dimension three, um, so that a uh, full set of joint reducibles will be isomorphic to n cube. And that could be done for every n. So that finishes, you know, 
the search, right, for... Um, so we were lucky to actually make the discovery, right, with the paper, otherwise we'll probably will spend the, our life forever, right, of trying to represent the three-dimensional. Now, um, what about ellipsoid order? Let me just maybe the last couple of minutes talk about this, because this is a good story there. Um, at the time when the paper of 99 um, was published, and even earlier, because already the result was known a couple of years before uh, publication, um, this author started thinking in the same direction. Okay, if the circles cannot represent any partial order, what if the ellipsoids could? We just allow ellipsoids, right? And then maybe we could represent every partial order, a finite partial order with ellipsoids. So they raised this question in a geometric containment order survey, right? Of which appeared almost at the same time as a paper for circular spheres. And they also published the, like a few years later, they actually did it for two-dimensional process. They said, yes, yeah, so we could even do only on a plane. We could just use an ellipsis on the plane and represent every two-dimensional process with ellipses, but then that was just left off and nobody followed, right? They're trying to uh, to see what, what happens with ellipsoids. Probably was, you know, so that it's more complicated than circles for representation. And then more recently, um, Kinsis, uh, he was actually inspired by a paper we wrote with Martina Bolat, right? And uh, he followed basically from that paper, following some questions there. And so he uh, showed this remarkable result showing like very genius construction there. He said, okay, convex geometry, any finite convex geometry of any convex dimension D could be represented by ellipsoids in a D-dimensional space. So the construction wasn't too difficult. So the construction is, Compared to this negative, you know, sphere result, it could just be um, presented on one page. It was, you just have that much more flexibility. With much more flexibility, exactly. Moreover, what he says, those ellipsoids can be made arbitrarily close to balls. So if you want to represent them by ellipsoids, which are most balls, they're just slight, <laughs> tiny, tiny, uh, modification from the ball, you could do it. So that's the most remarkable. So you you could do with any small small change in the balls, you could still do it, right? And the, and the dimension is the same as a convex dimension. I don't know if it could be improved. Maybe you could use a smaller dimension. Of course, there's a, always more questions than answers. And we thought, oh, we just take that Kinsa's result and we prove that every finite ball set is an ellipsoid order. We just, nobody thought about this before. I mean, you would need to connect, right? So again, using the same lemma as we, we did for spheres, you could introduce the same definition of convex hull on ellipsoids. It still will be an exchange operator. So it will still form convex geometry. And if you use the ellipsoids for representation, um, you build convex geometry, the pulse set of joint reducibles again represent the ellipsoid order, the same as for the balls, no change. And then there is this famous Birkhoff's theorem of 1937 that says, okay, every pole finite pulse set is a set of joint reducible elements of some distributive lattice. Well, so now you, you do the, the proof like that. So take any finite pulse set. Generate the lattice of lower sets to get the distributive lattice from Birgov construction, right? So he proved that you will get distributive lattice. Now, distributive lattice in particular is convex geometry. So go use Kinsa's construction to represent this convex geometry question by ellipsoids. And then here we go, those ellipsoids represent your partial order of joint reducibles. So connecting Birgit's result with a Kinsa's result, you answer for free, right? The ellipsoid question. Um, so I thought that it's um, remarkable to 
um, to connect the dots, like showing how everything is <laughs> connected, right? Mm -hmm. And also remarkable how the recent development was following exactly the same steps as the development of 80s and 90s and pulse sets. And now connecting them actually makes a lot of sense. All right, so what are the remaining questions? So like I have uh, maybe the last minute to, to tell you about, the, of course, the, the amount of questions remaining is even more than it was before. So for example, this, because of the Ramsey theorem and the proof of result of 99, we don't know how big is this humongous and, and not. And even the authors themselves asked at the end of the paper, can we prove that the same counterexample exists for n equal 100, for example? So maybe geometry on a 100 element set or on a pulse set on a 100 element set will be not representable. But they would say, oh, you would need completely different argument for that. So to find a concrete and actually attainable example of pulse set that's not representable by spheres. And so we don't even have any estimate Right, so how big that X must be, right? So for convex dimension three not to be representable. Now, we also, there are a lot of questions about ellipses. The Kinsis, the same paper, 2017, used some Ramsey type results existing before that paper, connecting again the dots for free, saying that not all convex geometries could be represented by ellipses on the plane. By ellipsoids, right, you go in a higher dimensional, you could do it, but on a plane, they are not. We don't even have a single example of a geometry, a practical example of geometry, like we did with Medina Bulat. We have five element geometry with a particular set of closed sets, right? That's not representable. So ellipses, we don't have it. We don't have a practical example of not representable by ellipses. And of course, now we know that Geometry not representable by circles on the plane, not representable by ellipses on the plane, we want to describe them. Is that a set of properties, the geometric properties of those structures that actually predict that they will not be represented? Yeah, so we need like really nice properties of a structure. And I finish with this nice picture. Mm -hmm. um, you see four students from this RAU. Uh, group, right? So Eric Rowland was also uh, a mentor at that time. And so at one of the Sundays, uh, we invited our students to come to Hofstra and we visited Hofstra and then we went kayaking in, um, in Oster Bay. Uh, so that's just before uh, kayaking in Oster Bay, we had some lunch. And so Araf is on the right here and Nama is in the center on the back. And I'm present there because I'm taking picture. So mm -hmm. thank you so much for for your attention. Questions? Is that, do you think the minimal, there is, so for convex dimension three, you showed that uh, not all geometries right. are representable circles. Is there any hope of finding the smallest one? Like, do you think it's- Yeah, this is what I, I think. That's what the first question that I, so like there. might be 10 or something. Yes, might be. Tiny. Might be. I mean, we, we do have a hope, like maybe I have 80% of that hope that we could prove for six elements that they will representable. But there are already 150,000, right? There's some, like a big number of them. So going further up, uh, already you, it's unattainable, maybe even by computer, but at least we do have ideas, right, for actual representation, the handling those cases, right, for six points, um, for six circles, right? Um, but what to do next is not clear. And um, it might be there is a property of, of small configuration of circles that prevents um, that representation, at least so that we carousel property, we're able to find the configuration of just five circles that prevents from our presentation. But unfortunately, this property already fails in, this, in the dimension three. Again, a big surprise. I thought that will be holding up in the next uh, dimension. So it means that in one dimension, you might have, like in the plane, you might have a property that doesn't allow to represent. It may maybe it just evaporates in a three-dimensional space. So it's a lot of surprises in this area. So I see like much more questions than answers right now. But at least we kind of 
made a connection to earlier studies of sphere overs. That's what you kind of I, I like in this work. So in your search, you were all of the examples you found you were able to represent? Yes. And the, and so you're trying to prove it in general, mm -hmm. but there's this instruction yes. for very large. Right, for very large, right. So, but how long it will will actually hold us from representation, absolutely not clear. And with ellipses, that's even a big mystery, right? Which one is like, maybe you could show something with, again, 10 points, like 10 circles, that's something not represent, 10 ellipsoid, right? Like not representable um, on the plane, right? So the plane is still a fraction, right? Because people could handle the questions, right? They could see clearly on the plane, right? When you go on certain, you know, three dimensional, it's already harder to even visualize it. So we uh, attracted to questions about planes, right? Particular. And I see the same um, in the sphere order. So there was a separate questions and representation of partial order set by circles on the plane compared to representation anywhere else. Uh, so they still have related questions. I don't think they answer it. So maybe we just need to work together with this connection, right? So as soon as we get it for convex geometries, the answer for all sets will be for free. It seems like searching for ellipses representation would be a lot harder because there's yeah. so many more yes, yes. rotate the ellipse and stretch it. Especially what King says, like it blew my mind, right? So you could re do representation with ellipses, ellipsoids as close to circles, mm -hmm. like balls as you want. Real yeah. matrices, like, it, um, uh, I, like what is an ellipse is there's going to be different axes that's uh, instead of having just a radius, you have something like a yeah. real diagonalizable matrix taking the same role. So instead mm -hmm. of one parameter, you have something kind of messy. Okay. Are there any other questions? Any questions? Uh, a quick one, uh, a quick question. Um, um, any relation to hyperbolas in the plane? Since you did circles and ellipses, the next one would be hyperbola. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a maybe natural extension of it. We, we cannot even sort out with the simple guys, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I, I agree with you. Yeah, that could be you know, representation. And uh, like someone earlier when I gave a talk, uh, maybe a couple years ago, suggested, oh, did you try like with um, semi-planes, right? Um, Alliance, right? That's you, you could use other um, objects definitely, right? And that all might be interesting. I agree. Thank you. All right, let's thank you again. Thank you so much.